What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Chasing Clarity Health and Fitness Podcast. This is your host, Brandon DeCruz, and today is episode 104, where we're going to discuss how to stop overeating and derailing your body composition progress in the process. And on today's podcast, I'm going to cover the top strategies for sticking to your diet and how to reduce your likelihood of overeating, or essentially how to break the habit of overeating. So before we get into today's episode, I just want to let everyone know that I've reopened my coaching roster for the month of April. And as of the time of this recording, it's the 1st of April, and this podcast will go live on Friday, April 5th. So if any members of the Chasing Clarity community are interested in individualized and customized one-on-one online coaching for both nutrition and training, please feel free to reach out to me through my email, which is btacruzfitness at gmail.com. You know, if you ever, if you guys are listeners of the show, you know that I very rarely announce having coaching spots open, but I just finished up a few personal projects that I've been taking a good amount of my, my time and I'm going to be taking on new clients again. So if you're someone who has the goal of looking better, feeling better, functioning better and becoming the very best version of yourself, I'd love to help you through the process of both a physique and lifestyle transformation. We're also currently 12 weeks away or 12 weeks out essentially from the start of summer. So if you're someone who wishes to get into the shape, you know, get into shape for summer and to be able to look your best, feel your best and feel confident and comfortable in your own skin, there's literally no better time to start than now. As the longer you wait, the less likely you are to start and the less likely you are to be in shape for when the warm weather arrives. So today's episode is going to be part four on our series on how to reduce your likelihood of overeating and slowing down your physique progress in the process. So if you have yet to listen to episodes 101, 102, and 103, which were parts one through three of this series, I encourage you to go back and listen to those other episodes first, as this episode is going to cover the strategies to reduce overeating behaviors like mindless eating, emotional eating, snacking behaviors, et cetera. And in last week's episode, I covered the lifestyle factors limiting you from getting lean and went through how stress, boredom, Mindless eating and sleep loss can increase your appetite, your calorie intake, and ultimately your body fat levels. So if you want to understand how different nutrition and lifestyle factors increase your likelihood of overeating, the last three episodes cover them in detail and also go over a lot of practical strategies that you can apply to your own life to make sticking to your diet easier and falling off and overeating less likely as well as more difficult to do. One of the main issues with slipping up off your diet and overeating is that if it happens frequently enough, it can become a habit that you fall into when you encounter certain situations, such as when you go out to eat at a restaurant, and instead of ordering a meal that would fit into your dietary targets, you aren't mindful when ordering, and you overdo it, and you end up in a massive surplus. It could also happen when you include highly processed foods into your diet, which can increase your appetite and your drive to eat. This can also happen when you're in an environment where you have access to lots of hyper-palatable tasty foods, which are extremely difficult and hard to moderate our consumption of. Or this can happen when you're stressed, you're dealing with uncomfortable emotions, or you're sleep deprived, and essentially, you're experiencing either physical or mental exhaustion. So on today's episode, I want to go through strategies that can help you break the habit of overeating and put you in the best position to make the best physique and health progress possible. Overeating is a situation many of you are familiar with, as most of us have been in a situation where we've eaten in in excess of our nutritional targets. Now, many look at an episode of overeating as an isolated situation that only impacts their diet that one day or during the week that it occurs in. However, if you're someone who frequently finds themselves overeating and blowing their nutritional targets for the day or even the week, it's likely that you're making a habit out of it, which causes you to become more and more susceptible to giving in and succumbing to this negative habit as time goes on, especially during times when you're experiencing high levels of stress or you're experiencing uncomfortable emotions. And this is due to the fact that every time you perform an action like overeating, whether you're overeating in response to hunger or stress or emotions, you're reinforcing and ingraining the habit of overconsuming calories into your lifestyle and into your daily habits, which is why being aware and mindful of this is especially important in order to break the habit of overeating. So the best way to break a negative habit that isn't in alignment with your goals and isn't conducive for your progression is to replace it with a better one. So on today's episode, I'm going to go through a ton of strategies and tips to help make sticking to your diet easier and to reduce the overall likelihood of you overeating. So these strategies are going to include things such as creating a consistent eating pattern, not fasting for long periods of time or skipping meals, 
tracking your nutrition and the many benefits that that can have, especially from like a creation of a dietary um, journal and really looking at your eating behavior, uh, eating behaviors and habits in greater detail, not eating in a distracted manner, incorporating mindful eating strategies into your eating routine, um, other you know tips and strategies such as slowing down your eating rate, reducing excess variety in your meals, not giving in to the what the hell effect, finding new hobbies that fill up your cup, and then also modifying and improving your food environment. So tip number one for sticking to your diet and reducing your likelihood of overeating is to create a consistent eating pattern and meal schedule. Your body operates best when you're on a consistent routine and schedule, and this is especially true from a nutrition perspective. This also applies to your hunger and satiety hormones, as these hormones get entrained based off the times you consistently eat. So to best manage your hunger, you want to eat at approximately the same times every day. So for example, the production of our primary hunger hormone ghrelin is heavily influenced by our usual meal schedule, as ghrelin is secreted prior to our usual eating times, which is why you'll notice that you'll generally feel hungry prior to the times in the day when you usually eat a meal. Even if you're not looking at your watch and, and your day is going by, you'll notice you know, 30 minutes before lunch, you automatically get hungry, if, even if you're not aware of what time it is. And so this is because ghrelin is secreted in those time periods. So you want to try to align your eating schedule in a manner where you eat meals at consistent times each day so that you can manage your hunger and regulate your appetite by eating meals and consuming nutrients at the regular times you experience the most amount of physiological or true hunger. And one error I see many make is to not take the same schedule-oriented approach to their nutrition and more specifically to their daily meal schedule and structure and timing that they do with their work and training schedules. Whenever I take a new client on, I'll ask them about what their daily schedule looks like in terms of their work, their eating, and their training schedules. And many times these individuals are able to give me a very precise idea of what their workday will look like in terms of timing and when they'll be in the gym to train, but often there's no schedule or routine in place for when they're eating and what they're eating as they tend to change this day to day and often you know, they're essentially winging it. I also have come to find that many who take a more flexible approach to nutrition cannot tell me what they're eating in addition to when they're eating it. And by simply creating a consistent eating pattern and meal schedule, where you know what you're going to eat in each meal and around what time each day you're going to eat those meals, you'll be much more likely to stay on track and exhaust much less mental energy throughout the course of a busy day, which can reduce and decrease your likelihood of overeating due to being unprepared. So what I suggest you do is write down your daily schedule, including the time you usually get up, the time you go to bed, and your work schedule, and then determine the times in the day when you can consistently eat. And I just talked about this topic with one of my new clients this morning, who gets up at 7 a.m. most days of the week, and he's planning on eating breakfast around 8 a.m. before starting his workday, where he goes to work at 9. His meal two will be around 12 noon, which is his lunch break. Meal three, which is his pre-workout meal, will be at 3 p.m. And then his post-workout meal will be at 6 p.m. once he's home from the gym. And then his final meal is going to be scheduled right around 9 p.m. So what you want to aim to do with your eating pattern is to main cons maintain consistency in terms of how many meals you eat each day and what times you consume those meals so that you can create a habit out of you know, what you eat and when you eat, and once you do this consistently, you'll be able to execute this on autopilot, which makes sticking to your diet far easier. So tip number two for sticking to your diet and reducing your likelihood of overeating is to avoid fasting for long periods of time or skipping meals. And things like intermittent fasting, or I've, I've discussed different topics related to fasting for long periods of time, including within day energy availability. But I really want you all to think of times when you've fallen off your diet or and, or essentially when you've eaten in excess. And usually this occurs after a long day where you've been so busy that you've either neglected to eat proper meals or you've intentionally skipped meals. And then by the time you get home from work, you're so hungry, tired, and stressed that your ability to make nutrition decisions that are in alignment with your goals is seriously hampered. And over the last 11 years I've been coaching, I've encountered a lot of individuals who have overeaten at some point during our time working together. And this is something I myself have also done in the past. So I'm guilty of it as well. And I've experienced it and worked through it. But the one thing I can say is that I've never encountered someone who overeats and binges on a ton of food at 9 a.m. in the morning after getting a full eight hours of sleep and having a nutrient dense, high protein breakfast. So if you're someone who struggles with overeating or binge restrict cycles, you want to avoid approaches that include fasting or long periods of the day without eating, as this can increase the risk of you falling off by the end of the day 
especially due to the increased hunger response that you'll experience from skipping meals and going long periods of the day without eating. Research also finds that long periods of fasting increase and heighten the reward and pleasure response we get from food and food-related cues. So for example, in a 2014 study, researchers examined how people responded to measures of food reward or the pleasantness or pleasure that they get from food when they were fasted as compared to when they were fed. So they found that participants' appetite scores, their hedonic ratings of liking food, so the pleasure response they got from it, the rating of reward value for snack foods, their explicit wanting and liking of foods from all categories, their specific wanting and liking of sweet foods, and their ad libitum calorie intake all significantly increased when they were in the fasting condition as compared to when they had eaten that day, meaning they were much more likely to overeat calories, especially through the consumption of hyperplatable, energy-dense foods after a period of fasting as compared to when they had eaten regularly. And this is a situation many of you who save your macros for the end of the day are most likely familiar with as often individuals who just follow macro plans where they have three macro targets that they're looking to hit on a daily basis, but no, no consistent meal structure will under eat and essentially under fuel themselves throughout the course of the day when they're at work or they're at school so that they have more calories to play with at the end of the day. But often this results in them overshooting their calorie intake and overeating due to how hungry they are by the time, you know, they do eat. And this is where it's beneficial for those of you who, out there to implement what's referred to as the four hour rule, meaning don't go longer than four hours of the waking day without having a meal. As we wanna make sure that we're not foregoing food for so long that we're experiencing and dealing with an excessive level of hunger, which may prompt us to overeat and slip up as a result. So you want to have a precautionary or essentially a proactive approach where you're giving your body and flooding it with nutrients, uh, giving it really high uh, nutrient dense meals in terms of great uh, you know, adequate protein intake, high fiber intake, you know, lots of fruits and vegetables so that you're satiated. And so you're not put in this position where you feel the need or you feel the drive to overeat. Tip number three for sticking to your diet and reducing your likelihood of overeating is to track your nutrition and to create a food diary. Our habits and what we habitually do is what determines our outcomes, especially from a body composition perspective. And to improve your body composition, whether that be through building muscle or losing body fat, you will need to alter and improve your habits around nutrition. You'll need to modify your eating behaviors and diet, dial in your diet quality and food selection. The majority of individuals can't get the physique progress they're looking for continuing to do the same things they've been doing. Because if that were the case, they would have already achieved the body composition goals they desired. Yet many can relate to being in a situation where they've been spinning their wheels yet going nowhere for far too long. And these are the individuals that they're putting a ton of effort and, you know, both physical and mental effort into the goal of improving their body composition, but they report that they feel skinny fat or they report that they feel like they don't even look like they lift. And it's not that they're not putting in effort, but oftentimes they're not putting effort into the right things. So it's not just about being consistent. It's about consistently doing the right habits, behaviors, and actions that are going to yield the physique progress you desire. And this is because most people's nutritional habits and behaviors don't leave them in a situation where they're able to achieve a lean physique and maintain it. And I've looked over at well over, you know, a thousand plus diet logs and food diaries. And very infrequently do I encounter someone who's eating sufficient protein and fiber and eating an appropriate calorie intake for their goals, especially if this person isn't tracking regularly. I've also yet to do a consultation with a new client who has never tracked yet is sufficient, is hitting sufficient protein and fiber intakes on a daily basis and is able to intuitively eat and continually achieve the physique progress they desire. So most people eat out of habit, not due to true physiological hunger. So they're not well suited to eat by intuition and need some tools to help them dial in their eating habits and behaviors. So tracking your nutrition and having a food diary helps you develop a greater awareness around your eating habits and behaviors. And when it comes to your eating habits and calorie intake, what gets measured gets managed and can also be modified. So if you don't know what you're eating and how much you're eating, it's really difficult to make the appropriate adjustments to get you closer to your goals. And this is why I'm a big advocate of using tracking, especially nutrition tracking, as a tool to help my clients learn about what's in the foods they eat, what their food habits and eating behaviors are like, and what we can modify to help them achieve their goals in a much more effective manner. Now, when it comes to the topic of tracking, I've done two full-length podcast episodes on this topic, which is episode 86, which is on the benefits of tracking your nutrition and how to get better at tracking. And then also episode 87, which is mastering macro tracking. And these were all about macro tracking tips to help you avoid common mistakes. So if any of you listeners out there 
want to take a deeper dive into the benefits of nutrition tracking and how to do it more effectively and efficiently, I encourage you to check those two episodes out. Another tool that can be especially beneficial for those of you who struggle with sticking to your diet and find yourselves overeating but not knowing how to reduce your likelihood of veering off track is to create what's referred to as a food diary. And a food diary is a daily log where you write down what you eat and drink each day, how much of these items you consume in terms of their portion sizes, and how you feel when eating these foods and meals in terms of your stress levels, your emotional state, and your feelings of both hunger and fullness. When I've had clients who have struggled with overeating, I've had many create a food diary, and that allows us to review the feelings and emotions they were experiencing when they had an overeating episode. So if you're someone who has struggled with overeating, I highly encourage you to create a food diary to learn about your eating behaviors and how different situations, feelings, and emotions impact your eating habits, your food choices, and then your overall calorie intake. And this is also a good exercise to use to objectively see when do you tend to eat the most food? Do you eat more when you're stressed or after a poor night of sleep? Are you making food choices that are conducive to your goals? Or do you notice that you're starting to just eat out of convenience? And these are all important questions to ask yourself and to find out about yourself so that if you are someone who's struggling to stick to your diet, you can find the root cause of the issue or the factors that predispose you towards overeating. And by becoming more aware of these predisposing factors, you could try to avoid them in the future, or you can utilize some of the tips in the podcast to work around these factors and reduce your likelihood and your chance of engaging in overeating moving forward. Now, tip number four for sticking to your diet and reducing your likelihood of overeating is to avoid eating in a distracted manner. Now, your eating habits, your food choices, your portion sizes, and your total calorie intake can be unconsciously influenced by your food environment, you know, the food cues, such as the sight and smell of foods, the serving sizes of the foods you eat, or how they're packaged, such as if you buy a single serving of a food or a bulk container from Costco, you know, what your perception of a proper portion or serving size is, which has been highly confounded and influenced by eating at restaurants, especially for those of us living in the States. You know, if you look at our portion sizes, they continually get larger, despite the fact that the amount of calories in restaurant meals are already far greater than most of us need and can handle from a calorie intake perspective. And they're also influenced by the amount of food variety we have available to us. As the more variety we include in a meal, the more calories we tend to consume, which is often termed the buffet effect, which we'll discuss later in this podcast. And our food behaviors are often are also massively impacted by where our attention is when we sit down to eat a meal. So eating in a distracted manner, such as eating while driving, eating while watching TV, eating while working on your computer or playing on your phone, have all been found to increase calorie intake with no additional benefit to your level of satiety. So you're essentially eating more calories to get the same level of satiety that you could have with much fewer calories had you eaten in a mindful manner. And the reason why we consume more calories when eating mindlessly is because it takes far more food for our brains to register that we've eaten enough and to receive the signals of satiety when you're eating in a distracted manner. And the issue is that many of us try to multitask in everything we do, especially when we're eating. So doing things like watching TV, playing on your phone, surfing the web, you know, driving while eating and scrolling social media are all examples of very common distracted eating behaviors. And a systematic review and meta-analysis conducted in 2012 looked at 24 studies on distracted eating. And what they found is that distracted eating leads to dysregulated hunger cues and satiety signals. They also saw that eating while being distracted with another activity leads to you eating more in that meal due to not feeling as full by the meal itself, and also leads to higher intakes of food the rest of the day due to your satiety signals being disrupted earlier in that day. And when discussing the concept of distracting eating and how it impacts, you know, and the impacts it can have on, you know, your intake, you know, often I'll, I'll discuss this with clients and I always ask them to think about the time that they consume the most amount of popcorn in one sitting. And I want you guys out there in the audience to really think about that. Think about, there's going to be something that comes to mind because almost a hundred percent of the time, when I asked a client this question, they answered that it was at a movie and they were able to plow through, say, a supersized buttered popcorn without thinking twice and well, without even feeling full afterwards due to being distracted and so engaged and enthralled by the movie they were watching. And this is where implementing mindful eating into your daily routines can have a massive you know, benefit. By simply focusing on the meal that you're having rather than on trying to do multiple things at once, you'll be able to feel more full from the meal itself and to be able to stick to your calorie allotment for that meal and for the consecutive meals that follow it. And remember, food is not only meant to serve as fuel, but also for enjoyment. But the only way you can enjoy it on a diet is if you actually pay attention and live in the moment, 
which will not only improve your relationship with food, but your ability to regulate your appetite and adhere to your diet. If you actually do so, if you actually pay attention to what you're eating and you're mindful about the situation and you actually pay attention to what you're eating and really get the full benefits from it, from both a nutritional a satiety perspective, but then also it's also going to have benefits on your digestive system. A lot of people that eat in a distracted manner or those that feel gas, bloating, digestive distress, indigestion, because they're rushing through this or they're distracted and they're really not aligning their behaviors with what they want out of their body. So this leads me to tip number five for sticking to your diet and reducing your likelihood of overeating, which is to incorporate mindful eating into your routine. Now, many of you have probably heard of the term mindfulness, but for many, it seems like kind of like an abstract concept. So let's define it first. Mindfulness is the practice of focusing your awareness and attention on the present moment. And research has found that mindful eating can help improve our awareness of our hunger and satiety signals, increase the satisfaction we feel from meals, and decrease our response to external food cues. And a 2020 systematic review on the effects of mindfulness-based interventions on the treatment of problematic eating behaviors like overeating found that participants in mindfulness-based intervention groups showed significant reduction in emotional eating, external eating, which is um, eating driven by external cues, binge eating, and weight and shape concern. And findings also suggest that increasing mindfulness or mindful awareness of internal experiences and automatic patterns could be effective for the improvement of self-acceptance and emotional regulation, thereby reducing problematic eating behaviors like emotional eating and stress-induced overeating. And there are a few mindfulness eating techniques which you can easily implement into your eating routine to improve the satiety you feel from your meals, to regulate your appetite more effectively, and to reduce the likelihood that you overconsume calories. So these techniques include putting the distractions away. So when it's time to eat a meal, go to your dining room or to an area that you can disconnect from everything, such as going to a break room and really focus on this expression. Be where your feet are. If you're in the moment, you're about to eat a meal. So turn off the TV, put down the phone and don't worry about emails. Just focus on the food that you're eating. Another mindful eating technique is to eat your meal slower. And many of you would benefit from slowing down your eating rate and allowing the satiety signals to reach your brain, which generally takes around 20 minutes, you know, between 15 and 20 minutes. And two other strategies that I use to help intentionally and purposely slow down my own eating rate, as I'm someone who spent years working on the gym floor and rushing in between clients to get meals down. And then also I had to do the same thing in the corporate world. So I actually utilize these even to this day. And one of these strategies is to use smaller silverware, such as small forks or spoons. So I'm not able to scoop us up as much food with each bite. And then I also put my fork down in between bites. So the next time you eat, I want you to try the following steps. First, be where your feet are. Just relax and be in the moment. Be intentional. Pay attention to what you're doing within that meal. Next, slow down your eating rate and your eating speed and chew your food more thoroughly. This is not only going to help from a satiety perspective, but will also help from a digestive perspective. And last, put down your fork or spoon in between bites. Because incorporating simple mindfulness techniques like these have been shown to help with eating behaviors, help with appetite control, and also help with weight control. As you need to focus on being mindful and aware when you're hungry so that you can make decisions that are more in line with your goals. So tip number six for sticking to your diet and reducing your likelihood of overeating is to slow down your eating rate, which I wanted to go a little bit more in detail. So how quickly or slowly you eat a meal can significantly impact how many calories you consume within that meal. So for example, some studies show that a 20% change in eating rate or a 20% increase in the speed of eating a meal can increase our calorie intake by 10 to 13%, which is something that can easily be done when consuming processed foods. So the actual research from that comes from a Kevin Hall study on processed foods. But other research finds between a 10 to 15% increase in calories consumed when individuals are eating faster. So this is where using some of the techniques I just covered, such as practicing mindfulness when you eat, putting our fork or spoon down in between bites, or using smaller silverware or even chopsticks, uh, chopsticks if necessary to slow you down can be hugely beneficial. I would also advise eating foods that take longer to chew and eat, which will increase the satiety response you get from meals, which will help you feel fuller and manage your hunger much more effectively. So stop eating convenient foods that are fast to grab and extremely fast to eat. So instead of grabbing a pork roll and cheese for breakfast or a bagel and cream cheese, have scrambled eggs and oatmeal. Instead of eating a cheeseburger and fries for dinner, have a lean cut of steak and a potato and include a low calorie density, high volume plant source, like a serving of vegetables or fruits with each meal so that you're going to be able to slow down your eating rate, chew these things thoroughly, get the fiber content and really get the food volume, but also the satiating effect from these. 
And choosing whole food options over processed convenient foods not only provides you with a greater nu nutrient density and less calories, but will also help you eat slower and feel more satiated. And this is beneficial because when you eat quickly, you're not only consuming more calories per minute, but you're also shortening the time span that your meal lasts. And our food needs time to reach our digestive tract and send signals to our brain to initiate the satiety and fullness response. And this process can often take 20 minutes. So for those of you who struggle with hunger and overeating, I want you to set a time the next time you have your normal lunch. If you're eating your normal food portion and then left looking for and wanting for more, look at how long it took you to scarf down that meal. And this is something I've done many times with clients who struggle with feeling satiated or who have digestive issues. And they often finish their regular meals within five to 10 minutes, which isn't nearly enough time for their body and, and brain to register the calories they've taken in. An eating rate and the time it takes to eat a meal has also been looked at in research and has been shown to have a significant impact on how full and satiated we feel from our meals, as well as how many calories we eat later in the day. So for example, in a 2018 study, researchers took participants and randomly assigned them into one of two groups. In both groups, or in both conditions, they ate a 600 calorie meal that was calorie and macronutrient equated. But one group was the fast eating rate group, which did so in six minutes, while the other group was the slow eating rate group, which ate that same exact meal, but over the course of 24 minutes. And the results found that those in the slow eating rate group experienced greater satiety, reported greater feelings of fullness, and had a more accurate memory of the portion sizes that they actually ate than compared to those in the fast eating rate group. They also found that those in the slow eating rate group experienced a greater suppression in their ghrelin levels post-meal. So even from a physiological perspective, despite both groups eating the same amount of calories and eating the same meals, eating slower had a greater benefit to suppressing the primary hunger hormone ghrelin. Now, three hours after both groups finished their meals, they also were given access to more food. And despite both groups being able to eat to fullness, those in the slower eating rate group ate an average of 25% less calories than those in the fast eating rate group. So overall, just slowing down your eating rate and chewing your food more thoroughly can help to increase the satiety you get from the same meals you're already eating, suppress your hunger hormones more, which will help you regulate your appetite and lower your drive to eat, can also help you to lead, you know, help lead you to making more appropriate nutrition decisions later in the day because you'll be feeling fuller and you'll be less likely to be experiencing excessive hunger, which could often lead you to overeating. All right, so tip number seven for sticking to your diet and reducing your likelihood of overeating is to modify your food palatability. So food palatability refers to how tasty a food is and how pleasant we find a specific food. And research has found that the palatability of a food, especially its taste pleasantness, is the most important factor that determines our food selection and our food preferences. The issue brought about the, the fact that our food selections and food preferences are most heavily influenced by the palatability of the foods we eat is that certain nutritional components, including have a, having a higher calorie density, meaning more calories per gram, higher fat, and higher sugar content, causes some foods to be more palatable than others. But these are the same nutritional components that are essentially make palatable foods less conducive for making physique progress, as these foods are more calorie-packed, yet less satiating, and can cause us to eat far more calories than we need to just to feel satiated and to manage our hunger. So they make controlling our calorie intake far more difficult. The fact of the matter is, the more that you like a food, the more of it you'll eat, and the more likely you'll be to overeat it, which is why most of you out there can relate to having overeaten, hyperplatable, super tasty items such as pizza, cookies, cakes, chocolate, ice cream, rather than less palatable items like chicken breasts or fruit and veggies, which are less palatable, but far more satiating. And the reason why we want to modify the palatability of the foods we eat and why this can help making this can help make sticking to a diet easier and overeating less likely is because the more palatable a food is, the more calories of it will consume. As we consume a higher amount of foods we like, and higher palatability foods also tend to be higher in energy density, aka calories per gram and calories per bite and serving. Also, the palatability of a food and its level of processing are correlated. So the more palatable a food is, the more likely it is to be ultra processed. And highly processed foods have also been found to increase our drive to eat and our total calorie intake. An easy example of this is to look at different forms of a common food that we're all familiar with, like a potato. A plain boiled potato is the most satiating food source on the satiety index, as it has a low calorie density, a high fiber content, and is minimally processed and has a moderate level of palatability. 
However, if you take that same potato and you fry it in a bunch of refined fats, you throw some sugar and salt on it, and you add some sweet and sour flavors to it to create a barbecue uh, potato chip, it's now a hyperplatable ultra processed food that has way more calories per bite but doesn't provide the, the, uh, the fiber and the water content that a boiled potato does. So you'll end up eating hundreds more calories of barbecue potato chips just to feel the same level of satiety that you would from a smaller serving of a potato. And there's been numerous studies done on food palatability and how it impacts and influences the amount of calories we eat at a meal and across the course of the day. So one of the best examples of this is a 2000 study. So in this study, researchers took a group of almost 600 participants and tracked their food intake over the course of the week in free living conditions. And after collecting their food records for a full week, they analyzed the palatability of their meals and ranked them from low palatability meals to high palatability meals based on the food sources that made up each of those meals. They found that when meals were made up of higher palatability food sources, these individuals ate 44% more calories than when meals were lower in palatability. They also found that when individuals were able to self-select their meals, the meals that they chose tended to be higher palatability meals more times than they would choose lower palatability meals, as these foods drive up us to not only consume more of them in a sitting, but also to develop a liking and wanting for them, where we want to go back for seconds soon after finishing. And this is because the more palatable or tasty a food is, the more this food triggers the reward center in our brains, especially from a dopamine perspective, which increases our likelihood to eat and overeat them. So eating hyperplatable foods is a slippery slope, especially during a diet. As the more of these foods you include in your diet, the more of them you'll want and you'll crave. And it'll make sticking to your calorie and macro budgets even more difficult than it already is due to the continual increase in hunger that we feel during a fat loss phase. So if you continually include and expose yourself to higher palatability foods, you're going to need to use more willpower, more discipline, and more mental energy to not overconsume them, which is a losing battle for many. The goal of modifying our food palatability is to manage our appetite, minimize excessive hunger, and maximize our ability to stick to our diet to see the results we're looking for. And this is why I advise you to modify the palatabilities of the foods you eat, especially if your goal is to get lean and stay lean, as including more lower palatability foods, including more whole and nutrient-dense food sources like lean proteins, fruits and veggies, non-fat dairy, and whole grains provides far greater satiety, have less calories per gram, and per serving, and decrease our hunger more effectively than hyperplatable foods, which often leave us wanting more after consuming them than we even did when we started. So tip number eight for sticking to your diet and reducing your likelihood of overeating is to reduce excess flavor variety in your meals. The more variety you include into your diet in terms of flavors and textures within a meal, the more hunger you're going to feel and the more likely you are to eat and overeat, especially in a single sitting. So this is why if this is why you shouldn't switch back and forth between varying flavors in a meal, such as going between savory and sweet foods, as this can drive our eating behaviors and cause us to consume far more calories to get full than if we just stuck with a similar flavor within a meal. And a lot of research has looked at flavor variety and has found that the more variety we have in a meal, the more likely it is to drive up our calorie intake. So for example, in a 2009 study, participants ate 33% more calories when offered sandwiches with four different fillings than when just one filling was offered, despite them eating to fullness in both conditions. This is also why we see what's referred to as the buffet effect. When we go to a buffet or we eat at a holiday dinner, like Thanksgiving, where there's a ton of food options available to us. And the buffet effect describes the fact that the more variety is offered in a meal, the more food you'll eat, as we tend to eat more calories when there's a large variety of foods that offer different flavors in a meal. And re a review, on the impact of dietary variety on energy intake found that when individuals are presented with a greater variety of foods within a meal, humans consume about 22% more energy compared to when only one food is available. Then longer term experimental trials in humans lasting one to two weeks generally find an increase in calorie intake of 50 to 60 calories per day for each additional food that's added into a meal. So say you added 10 additional foods throughout the course of the day, we could look at five to 600 calories increase per day as a result of that. And then in most of the feeding studies we have, they find that dietary variety within a meal increases intake by 22 to 25% of calories. So the more variety you expose yourself to in a meal, the more you provide your body with a new and novel stimulus, which drives even more hunger and cravings. And this is especially important in, you know, deeper into a diet when hunger is highest and mental fatigue has accumulated, which is why if you're sitting down to a meal, it's best to stick with a specific flavor profile instead of constantly switching between flavors. 
A great way to do this is if you're going to have a salty, savory meal, like a chicken breast and baked potato with veggies, stick to those food sources within that meal and use condiments that complement that flavor profile, like hot sauce, rather than trying to piece together some wild combination of foods, such as having salty scrambled eggs and sweet funfetti protein pancakes, and then having Pop-Tarts as your carb source. Because if you make your meals up of food sources that are more aligned with one another from a flavor profile, such as scrambled eggs and roasted potato slices, you'll feel far greater satiety and be far less likely to overeat. Plus these foods are easy to prepare together and will require much less mental effort and physical effort to not only prepare, but to track. Because really what I find is that there are many individuals who try to make their meals too fun and flavorful, and they spend an excessive amount of time trying to craft recipes and they waste time trying to play macro Tetris, which can be fine from time to time. But if you're doing this for every single meal, you're going to put yourself in a position where you're experiencing excessive decision fatigue and you're more likely to just say, screw it and order takeout or go for something that's more convenient on the days that you don't have the time or energy to make a creative meal from scratch and then try to fit this, you know, macro creation, this, this uh, Franken food into your daily macro count. The next topic I want to cover are tips for reducing snacking behaviors. As snacking is a behavior which many engage in on a frequent basis, which raises their total calorie intake and causes them to overeat without even realizing it. As snacks are often easy to grab and eat items like chocolate, cookies, and nuts, which so many people are used to just grabbing and gulping down that they don't even realize how many calories these items contain, and they often don't track it either. And so in order to stick to your diet and the nutritional targets that are needed to get to your goal, you want to increase your awareness around your snacking behaviors so that they're not done mindlessly where you don't even register or acknowledge the fact that you're taking in hundreds more calories per day than you're actually tracking. And this is where implementing a few helpful strategies to minimize your snacking or improve upon the snacking that you do engage in can be extremely helpful for managing your appetite and your total calories. So the first strategy to modify your snacking behaviors is to limit your access to treats, snacks, and hyperplayable foods. If you're going to have snacks and tasty foods at home, store them in one spot to limit your exposure to them. Because the worst approach to take is to have snack foods scattered all across your home and your workplace, such as on your countertops, on your desk, in your, in your office, you know, in different pantries throughout the house, because then you'll be exposed to food cues at multiple time points in the day and in multiple locations, which can increase the amount of temptations you experience and the cravings you have and the likelihood of you giving in to these snacks and treats on a frequent basis. The next strategy would be to limit the amount of snack foods you bring into your home. One way to limit the amount of snacks and treats you eat is to limit the amount you're exposed to. And that starts with modifying what you buy and you bring into your home. Do yourself a favor and honestly, do, the, do yourself and the rest of your household a favor. And buy less of the hyper playable calorie packed processed foods you all have difficulty moderating your intake of and opt for foods that will help you feel more satiated when eating them rather than leaving you hungry and wanting for more. And this can include items like having fresh and frozen food available. Um, having vegetables like carrot and celery slices, Greek yogurt, things of that sort that are going to be lower energy density, but much higher satiety. Next would be to opt for higher protein snacks. So if you're going to snack, try to make it something you're not going to overindulge on and blow your calorie budget with as a result. So having items like a whey protein shake, a protein bar with high fiber count, like a Quest bar, or a non-fat Greek yogurt is a great way to help kill that snacking urge without going, excuse me, without going over your calorie allotment. The next strategy would be to buy pre-packaged portions, uh, pre-portioned packages, essentially. So one of the main reasons snacking holds many back from achieving their goals is it's usually done in excess, even if you don't realize. It. So if you actually were to calculate and add up the amount of calories you're eating from snacks, usually it's three, four, 500. And that could easily derail your physique progress, put you in a substantial surplus if you're eating at maintenance or completely erase the deficit you're trying to create and halt fat loss. So this is where taking advantage of our modern conveniences can be to our, our benefit, as many snacks come in pre-packaged snack sizes, which can limit the amount you consume per serving. The one thing you want to do is avoid eating out of packages or boxes. So opt for snack size bags of chips versus family size bags. Look for single serving bags of popcorn, like the 100 calorie packs, versus the movie theater tub. Or go for a pint of Halo Top, which is a reduced calorie ice cream that has higher protein and fiber content rather than a gallon of ice cream. So that if you do snack, you're less likely to overdo it, especially from a calorie perspective. And last but not least, if you do happen to have a snack or treat, track it. The calories you consume count whether you count them or not. And if you happen to have a snack, just subtract those macros from the rest of your daily intake or from the next day's intake. So for example, if you have 300 calories from say chips or chocolate 
or cookies. Just reduce your daily intake the next day by 75 grams of carbs, or you can do a combination of carbs and fat. So that could be 50 grams of carbohydrates and 11 grams of fat to make sure that your average calorie intake across the week is kept constant and in line with the targets that are set to help you hit your goals. For the next portion of this podcast, I want to go through some of the mindset and lifestyle tips for sticking to your diet and reducing your likelihood of overeating. The first being to stop giving into the what the hell effect. Now, the what the hell effect describes a cycle many fall into when they overindulge and regret what they've done, but look at this overindulgence as a sign of failure. So they rationally rationalize going back for more. An example of this would be if you were dieting and someone in your office brought in donuts or cupcakes and you, you eat one. After eating one, you feel like you've already fallen off track for the day. So instead of getting right back on track, you rationalize eating more by thinking, what the hell, I already messed up, so I might as well eat as many as I want. And many of us have been in a situation where we've slipped off, off our diet by eating something off plan or inaccurately tracking a meal and wondered what to do next. And this is a situation I always advise clients to put it past them when they encounter as what's done is done and we need to focus on what we can control going forward which includes what else we eat in the day as you're always just one meal away from being on track, which is something I really want you guys to really take on. You're always just one meal from being back on track. However, there are so many individuals who get disinhibited when they slip up off their diet. So instead of accepting that they've eaten a cookie or had too much of a specific food that was off plan, they suffer from the what the hell effect. And they just keep eating off plan as a result of that one slip up. And logically, this doesn't make any sense as having gone 200 calories over your calorie intake for the day, shouldn't lead you to say, screw it, and going 2,000 calories over as a result of the guilt and discouragement you feel from slipping up. And the what the hell effect is something I've encountered with many individuals and you know something that they come to, come to me with having experienced previously. And I've seen it in our own, uh, especially in the beginning of us working together. And it's also something that we see in the research. So it's not something that it's just, we're just seeing in practice. This is both a clinical observation as well as a practical observation. So in one study, they took two groups of participants and one group of individuals were currently on a weight loss diet and another group of individuals were not currently on a weight loss diet. And they had all participants come into the lab and gave each a meal containing the same exact amount of calories, but they manipulated how the meals were presented to them in terms of the portion sizes and gave some what appeared to be a larger serving and others what appeared to be a smaller serving, despite both meals containing the same amount of calories and macros. So visually, it looked to participants that they were either given a larger or a smaller serving as compared to the person that was eating next to them. After the participants finished the meal, they were given the opportunity to taste and rate some cookies and could eat as many or as few as they liked. Now, what many would think is that those who had received a larger looking meal prior would eat less cookies. But what they found was that when they gave those who were on a diet a larger appearing meal, they ended up eating significantly more cookies after. And they reported that they did so as they had already overeaten at the meal prior. So this was an example of them giving into the what the hell effect. So if you're someone who has found themselves in this situation, I encourage you to shift your perspective from looking at a slip up as something that prompts you to just say, screw it and to stuff your face. And instead look at a slip up as an opportunity to make better decisions moving forward. Deciding to say, screw it and eat whatever, just because you slipped up during one meal of your diet is like getting a flat tire during a road trip. And instead of replacing that tire, you slash the other three and cancel your trip. It makes no sense and it doesn't serve you. The next mindset tip is to stop engaging in dichotomous thinking, which is thinking and looking at nutrition and your diet in black and white terms. And this mentality often leads to regression and or failure. Those with a dichotomous mindset view dieting as all or nothing, 100% on point or 0% on plan, so when they have a slip up or something doesn't go according to plan, they just say, screw it and just continue eating off plan, which contributes to the downward spiral they're experiencing and often adds insult to injury. And if you stop tracking after you slip up in a meal and decide to just keep going because you've already messed up, you're adding insult to injury, which reduces your self-efficacy and reduces your likelihood of succeeding long-term. Research done on the effects of thinking in black and white terms finds that dichotomous beliefs about food and eating mediates the association between eating and weight regain, which can hinder individuals' ability to maintain a healthy weight. The next tip to reduce your likelihood of overeating and looking to food for comfort is to find new hobbies that fill up your cup. For many of us, training is one of the, our favorite hobbies, but I also noticed that many seem to lack hobbies outside of training in the gym. And those who do have hobbies often engage in activities that aren't conducive for their physique goals and aren't aligned, aren't aligned with the body that they want and the quality of life they desire. 
such as eating when bored or drinking alcohol as a form of entertainment or even as an escape. And this is where diversifying your hobby profile or portfolio and finding activities that do not center and revolve around eating and drinking can be massively beneficial. For me, I really enjoy hobbies that involve me getting outdoors and into nature, as I spend most of my days either sitting in front of my computer or walking on my treadmill desk in front of my laptop answering check-ins. So really, when I'm not working, I like to visit state parks and hiking trails. I really like to get out into nature. I want to disconnect from technology and just be in a, in a place that um, I feel one with nature. And then I'm also experiencing the stress-reducing benefits of being outdoors. And so what I would advise is to invest in pursuing some hobbies and activities that will fill your cup, but ones that also don't reinforce poor habits that you're trying to replace and get away from engaging in such as overeating. So this could look like trying something outdoors, picking up a new sport or joining an intramural league, um, becoming a coffee connoisseur. This is something that I really like. So I don't brew coffee myself or roast coffee myself, but I do have clients that do that and they're very into it, um, doing fresh brews, but I'm someone that I really like different, uh, visiting different cafes and trying different roasts and, and blends. And so that's one of my hobbies on weekends. Uh, it could be look like picking up an art or creative activity, like painting or pottery it could be picking up an instrument and learning how to play it. This is something that Jeff, uh, my co-host for chasing clarity just recently got back into, and he plays the guitar every single day. Or it can even be dog training. I have a very good friend that uh, he loves dogs. And this is something that has become one of his main hobbies is training not only his dogs, but actually now that now he helps people in the neighborhood with their dog training. And these are all activities which will reduce your stress and improve your overall health, but will also lower your likelihood of overeating when you're stressed or bored. The last life, uh, lifestyle tip for improving your ability to stick to your diet and reducing your likelihood of overeating is to modify and improve your food environment, which I covered in detail and went over a ton of strategies for in episode one or two of the podcast. Now, your brain is highly reactive to the cues in your surroundings, especially from a food perspective. And what you expose yourself to in terms of the foods in your environment is what will drive your motivation towards certain food choices and influence your eating behaviors. So how you set up your food environment can have a massive impact on what you eat and how much of it you eat, which is why you should look to set up your food environment in a manner that makes it so that the habits and behaviors you need and want to engage in to get to your goal are easy to do, yet the habits and behaviors you don't want to engage in any longer, which could deter and, and essentially hinder your ability to get your, to your goals, are now harder to do. And by constructing a conducive food environment for your goals and current diet in both your home and your workspace, you'll increase your ability to adhere to your program and better regulate your appetite while reducing the likelihood of experiencing cravings, feeling tempted, and being triggered to binge based on what's around you. And overall, adherence to any diet or training program is the most important factor that dictates whether you'll see results or not, yet it's the factor that people struggle with most, especially from a nutrition perspective. And this is where implementing some of the tips and strategies I laid out in this podcast can be helpful for improving your ability to stick to your diet, reducing your likelihood of overeating, and can help you get better results in the process. So as always, guys, thank you for listening to another episode of the Chasing Clarity Podcast. If you found the strategies and tips I, pro I provide in this podcast helpful, please reach out and let me know which ones you implemented and how they've worked for you so far. As many of these come from a decade plus of working with clients one-on-one -on -one to help them improve their habits and behaviors around nutrition and also their mindset and perspective on nutrition, which ultimately has resulted in my clients attaining better physique progress and a better relationship with food. And if you did like the show, please share this episode on your stories and tag me at Brandon DeCruz underscore so that we can reach other individuals who could benefit from this type of information. As my goal has been and always will be to bridge the gap between research and information and practical application so you all can feel, can look better, feel better, and function better. Hope you all have an incredible weekend and I'll be back at the same time, same place next Friday. Peace.